Hey everyone, welcome back. Today's a bit of a different video. It's discussion time. I originally wasn't going to plan out and release a TenoCon 2023 video since I really just wanted to experience it myself attending and just enjoy my time there. In retrospect, I've had many, many people come to ask me my thoughts, even on stream, whether I was playing Warframe or not. So you know what? Let's just talk about it. And for those that wonder if it's worth attending in person, I absolutely think it's worth it if the travel isn't a huge problem and you, if you're okay with large conventions with a lot of people around. It leaves you free to explore that venue checking out arts, thematic exhibitions, playtest stations that time for Wayfinder and Mobile Warframe, decent eats, but with the Warframe flair, etc. We got burgers from a Dog Days beach themed stand. I got to meet some cool people. Streamer friends have found some comfy beanbag seats. There was even a simulacrum testing room where you could try out some prop guns or something, but I couldn't get in because that line was forever insanely long. That said, the price tag can be prohibitive for some people to commute, so it's up to you. We also got to meet some super cool cosplayers and of course seats if you were fast enough to the main events. I'd definitely go again next year and it was nice being able to attend after Tenocon being virtual the past three years. But that's not what this video is supposed to be about. We're supposed to go over the big headlines of Tenocon 2023. There's quite a lot of stuff that turned heads in the announcement section. Specifically, we're going to be focusing on the lead up into Teno Live and the actual reveals. First, let's go over upcoming Warframe content. We know Abyss of Dagoth is coming in update 34, October, just in time for the Halloween update and probably shipping alongside our typical Deimos Daughters wares. Later in the year, realistically Christmas, we're supposed to get Whispers in the Wall update, which is where the Rap Tap Tap and the Necroloid Syndicate finally get answered. This is where we meet the new Murmur faction, complete with the Fragmented Ones, Story Boss and other crazy stuff as well as access to a new weapon, the Grimoire. Whether this is an entirely new weapon type, we don't know. Whether it uses a new weapon slot, we don't know. But it is seen to holster for the Soma, so it's likely to be a pistol slot. Then, in 2024, supposedly after we transfer us into the giant vessel, is when Warframe 1999 is expected to arrive. Realistically, I expected this to be in the spring-summer schedule, and it makes the most sense to ship in late April, early May. But for how ambitious the content shown was, I won't be surprised if it gets delayed into June-July. These represent huge steps for Warframe into Arc 2, since we finally closed the book on the original looming sentience war returning after 9 years. A completely blank slate for Rebecca to lead us into the new lore. We also got a solid look into Soul Frame, with noticeably more polish than last year. There are still some obvious kinks and issues, but I consider it a massive improvement. I'm gonna be honest, last year when I saw the initial Soul Frame reveal, I was laughing. There was no way to combat, physics was awkward, no context, no world to really believe in. It really just felt like a combat simulator, which it was. Combat simulators are fine, but at the same time, I did not believe it was a point worth showing yet. This year was different. While it still is in a very controlled dev environment, for the first time we saw how level design was intended, how skill trees are supposed to be implemented, more nuances by animation and weight for physics were added to combat, the tone of storytelling via narrative leading and VAs, envisioned how boss combat would be introduced, etc. It is far from perfect, but a much better demonstration as a pitch of what to expect from the game. Then of course, the heirloom bundle fiasco and Responsa's companion rework changes, Hydroid rework, and more. This is going to be a pretty beefy initial listing, so let's get into it. Dagoth is arriving with October, said to be the scariest lore yet, I'm interested in seeing how this turns out, since Chains of Heroes the last time I recall DE trying to do a horror quest. Granted, it was pretty spooky, but still not true abominations or horror. Rather, it played on our fear of darkness by significantly limiting visibility and what's lurking in the shadows. If the Murmur faction is anything to go by, DE has the potential to make Daggett's quest line a lot spookier. Daggett looks like some mix between a Void Angel and Sentient inspired aesthetics, so I'm very interested. But you know what the first thing I think of when I see Daggett? One of those Dyson hair dryers. Anyways, she is coming with a signature blade and whip that is yet to be named. Perhaps this might be an opportunity to revisit and clean up blade and whip stances, as they are rather unintuitive in a forgotten melee class. I think the only one people really talk about these days, which is rare enough, 
is the Jad Kusar, which is due to its crit stats rather than its stance, and nor any present gimmicks or lack thereof or synergies. While a bit much, it would be nice to take a look at them, since the last time they were a hot topic was back when melee could hit through walls where blade and whips, specifically, could hit 30 plus meters through them with ribbons due to old range scaling as a percent of a move's hit range rather than a flat increase as it is now. I'm hoping we move a little bit away from the generalist frames we have been getting lately and go back to a more thematic direction. Not just aesthetic or elements, but adding new mechanics to the game. Citrine to this day is the only readily accessible source of status chance buffs in the game after 10 years, and is a step in a more unique direction. But again, she's a generalist, and if only her crystals on our floor worked properly, or did not limit build options as much as they do. But yeah, Saren's spore mechanic on rework, Nidus' stack system, Gauss's redline interactions, Grendel's stomach mechanic. Yes, I know people don't like Grendel being forced to eat to use abilities, but his entire kit is a lot more accessible these days now compared to pre-rework. But I'm waiting for a new Warframe or personality that adds a new way to play the game instead of another partial new partial tank setup using already established mechanics. While Jyner is extremely strong post augment and simple to use, I believe she's one of those frames that suffers from lack of identity beyond just being a walking nuke. The thematic mechanics in Dagatha do not need to be mandatory for her to function like Randall's eat mechanic, but rather a bonus to improve kit mechanics or options such as how Gauss's redline interacts with his full kit. That's what I want. A frame with personality that brings a fresh mechanic to the table. Regardless, less than two months from now, Abyss of Dagath is arriving. Honestly, I was hoping it'd be a bit sooner and seems to be a bit delayed, but as long as the content is solid, well, there are many things to play while waiting. There are also supposed to be a fair amount of undisclosed quality of life improvements over the next few months, so stay tuned to see what we get. The Christmas update ships with whispers in the wall, and let me just say, I only have one complaint. Why the hell does Albrecht have so many rooms in his laboratory? I swear so many of them are just aesthetic rooms for the purpose of looking nice, but yeah, that's another small nitpick. Anyways, the big things are that this is the next step from Rap Tap Tap, which you can already see here if you listen in at the Necroloid Syndicate in Deimos. Come Christmas, we finally get to see what is beneath. Why Albrecht went to sleep. While Albrecht was so scared of the man in the wall and what his secret machinations were for. This also comes with our enigmatic Remar, a completely new weapon with completely new powers. Ever wanted unlimited shocking power? Now's your chance. I'm really secretly hoping this is a completely new weapon class, but something tells me it's gonna be just a run-of-the-mill new pistol slot weapon. Anyways, we really know very little about the Grimoire, so we'll just have to wait and see. And the Calamo sequence has begun. He named it after his Kavat. Honestly, I think this Kavat has a bigger role to play in the story, since it also slept with them in his capsule after Lloyd hammered it shut. Thus, Albrecht disappeared from our timeline. Or, well, his timeline, for now. And yes, Lloyd of the original timeline, as our current Lloyd we're familiar with, is a fragment of Robot Replication Albrecht's personal assistant. They seem to share similar memories with our Lloyd probably uploaded with a long forgotten original purpose. He is the personal assistant embodiment after all. Nevertheless, we awaken the sleeper, the original Lloyd, who remains alive in his own cryopod. Also, getting to this point introduces us to a new Faction. The Murmurs. I really hope this is a proper new faction, not a token one like Narmer's. While Narmer is cool and all, and at least is a full realization of what an altered faction can be like, much beyond how the Corrupted are basically just reskins with very few minor additions, but the Murmurs look nothing like anything we've seen before in Warframe. True horror. Also, reused as the faction name since Liches deal with the Requiem mods, which do call on the powers of the Void to sever the mortality powers of Kuva. These originate from Deimos lore, where Isolation Vaults use Requiem mods as Locks, Zack using Zad as Whisper, Grasp of Lock, and the Lost referencing Fass and Riss. This confirms how Deimos is not just a retcon, but intends to be tightly bound to the future narrative of the Void, the center of our power and a portal into the true Void Abyss rather than Lua just serving as an anchor for a Tenno power. Also, this boss. While not as crazy as some I've seen in other games while considering abominations, is a welcome departure from the more generic standard bosses we used to have in Warframe. I would greatly appreciate the detail and animations of the boss part seeming realistic and deliberate in their actions. 
The boss literally looks threatening and dangerous as it attacks. It has a multitude of them and it would be a welcome boss fight with bigger attack hitboxes. A grander stage with more mechanics, but that's what you would get into more challenging content and raids. As an enemy alone, this is far more interesting than the Archons added in as a permanent content post new war. Archon skill sets were tuned for drifters and operators and is not tuned well for Warframe gameplay. This fragmented one puts up a much better interesting fight. I also like how the fight incorporates the body parts from the ground in second phase, allowing the arena to slightly factor into gameplay in the fight instead of just a singular enemy in a green space. While not perfect, it doesn't need to be, and represents an actual interesting fight compared to Warframe standards. This Steel Path Aura Worm, not normal mode. The Steel Path one and this fight are good stepping stones towards more engaging boss fights in the future. And if I might dream, raids one day. All you'd have to do for future content and harder content is bump up the enemy damage, add cover you could use, bigger attacks, include more adds, and include a more involved arena with fight mechanics. There you go, a raid encounter with a central threatening enemy. For those that comment, well, you can just blow it up with the power creep. Just attenuate it. And I don't mean Archon Hunt Attenuation, attenuate it properly, it's very doable. Many, many other games do this for later game content. Warframe just has a habit of implementing things weirdly, with Archon Attenuation being a prominent, improper implementation. Did you know, Acolytes also have Attenuation, but it's also somewhat bugged. If you've ever tried to kill them without explosive projectile AoE, as in not a Brahma, not a Zar, not a Glaive, not Contagion, you probably notice it actually takes some firepower to take them down. Not ridiculous amounts, but actual firepower. Also, if the boss actually puts up a proper fight, it's not going to be as brain dead and as annoying as Archon Hunts either. Remember, Archon Hunts were designed to put up a fight against your Drifter, not your Warframe. The coolest part of this all though was the tongue in cheek hilarious dial up contraption used to transfer into the vessel. This is obviously deliberate in a workshop of Albrecht's arrow with literal magical books, complicated contraptions, and cutting edge research. We do know based on his lore from Lloyd that he likes to collect things from the heiress. But yeah, you know that train we saw earlier in the trailer? That's important because symbolically, it appears again in Warframe 1999. Whether we wanted it or not, we've stepped into a war with the Cabal on my- wait, wrong game. We've stepped into the past, taking control of a certain Arthur with a suspiciously similar getup to Excalibur. Some may mention this is the original Excalibur before the Orican era. I don't think so. Dark Sector is the predecessor to Warframe, and DE themselves have said in the past that Warframe was the spiritual successor, where they could make the game become what they always wanted. Dark Sector has always existed as a separate entity, but with no in-game direct linkages suggesting canon relations to Warframe, just inspired. But out of game, there have been many coincidences of lore dump from flavor text, discussions, skin announcements, and more that have made it very difficult to refute some kind of relation. I also want to make it clear, this transition is just a coincidence. Whisper in the Wall does not directly link into Warframe 1999. This is just a convenient cinematic plot device used to introduce us into the next update. There will be a gap in plot between us transference into the giant and whatever ends up leading into the 1999 chapter. It's a bit complicated, but this is the situation. DE loves Dark Sector. They worked on the IP. They cannot use content from Dark Sector in Warframe, nor can they directly incorporate Dark Sector named elements directly into Warframe. As weird as it sounds, this is what is going on as they don't have the publishing rights anymore and why Warframe 1999 is the way it is. Once you understand that, it becomes a lot clearer. DE wants to bring Dark Sector into Warframe. This way, the lore of Dark Sector and whatever baggage it brings does not directly interfere with pre-existing Warframe lore and they can continue to write this early timeline however they want. Eternalism strikes again. But technology from one continuity can cross into the other and that's exactly what is going on in Warframe's second act. Dark Sector elements and flesh but renamed is being canonically linked to Warframe's main universe and Eternalism's branching timelines. Arthur, who actively uses Furious Javelin in the reveal several times, is named Arthur because Hayden Tenno was also Excalibur in that depiction and the name of the Sword of the King of Knights, as well as Arthur, the King of Knights. His contact, we can literally hear the Magpul sounds, is Aoi. 
Aoi means blue in Japanese, and before modern Japanese also was used to describe green before the term Midori came to exist. And if you look at the original Meg in Warframe, she was blue-green in color scheme. The motivation behind names is obvious, but the bigger giveaways are the old-school weapons in AK-47 and instead of the glaive we have, well, a version of the Skana. I don't exactly know why they didn't use the glaive, but it's probably due to a likeness issue to Hayden Tenno and copyright problems from Dark Sector. The enemies he's fighting, they are modernized versions of the Technocyte virus, and that particular virus is somewhat similar to the Warframe infestation, but instead of animalistic transformations and putrid protrusions and bodily fluids, the Technocyte creates a certain a familiar metallic crust on the body. Excalibrambra, anybody? This transformation was so painful that people literally go insane, so these TV computer wire technocyte thingies are not exactly a good representation of Dark Sectors of Virus, nor Warframes Infested, but functions as a stand-in of Dark Sectors looming threat. So are these actually modified strains of the Infested? We won't know until it's time, but this is the closest you can get to paying an homage to Dark Sector, by incorporating figurative assets of the spiritual predecessor into Warframe. This is where the next story arc begins. By unraveling Albrecht's history, I suspect Albrecht is now the man in the wall in this scene. Albrecht cut his tongue out when he encountered Wally in the Void as a result of his failsafe diving bell breaking. He was unsure of what returned was whether him or not, and whether or not he would be the one destroying the world. This Albrecht talks perfectly fine, so I suspect it wasn't actually him. Also, the Void Tongue talking at the end, as the new countdown goes off for Y2K. A nod towards the Y2K technological limit for those that remember. With hardware failures from being unable to store dates in and after the year 2000. We even hear the crowd cheering in countdown, which, interestingly, was actually from the Tenocon crowd. Okay, and now Soul Frame. The big thing is proper co-op, seamless transitions, which I'm not sure if they're gonna make into the final build, with an open world leading into dungeons you can tackle with a mixture of magics and physical combat. Animations have improved and we now have this sword throwing thing that TE appears to be fond of. There is context to the story now, and the VA is once again, as expected from DE, top notch. Keep in mind this is still a dev build, but compared to last year, there is a lot more going on than before. It is no longer just a combat system showcase, we have interactive environments that may or may not play a bigger role in the future, a more show than tell narrative style, and we know that our setting is in a post-catastrophe timeline. Something has set into the nature of the world, corrupting it, and it is up to us to figure it out. There's still a little bit of physics jank like that ridiculous ragdoll from the wolf, but honestly it's funnier if anything. The swings have proper delays now, but I still feel the swing acceleration feels weightless in some animation. It has distinguished itself from Warframe's jerky melee animation somewhat, but still does not feel heavy enough. Speaking of animations, they're actually pretty good for NPCs, but player awareness would help the immersion. This avocado is looking at the camera instead of up towards the player, either put them on a rock or angle the camera somewhat and have them looking that way. But that's just a minor nitpick. The music and ambiance were decent for our early reveal, but it really kicks up in the boss fights later. Bonfire lifts. Anyways, uh, the lake of our ancestors, as they said. I really like how we fall into our minds to access our home base, the Nightfold. I don't recall if it was said situated on the Silvering Sea. The Sovereign Sea, it was a little bit hard to hear, but we're essentially setting up camp in the Lake of Our Ancestors. You'll be meeting the NPCs and souls of our ancestors and bring them here as you go through your journeys, so your home base will grow as you progress the game. More alive than the Lissette, so to speak. Envoys follow a more RPG-style progression this time with the character stat system. The primary method is via the path of virtues, be it spirit, courage, or grace. These are essentially your stat scaling which determine how your skills will affect combat and possibly dialogue options, etc. We don't know the full extent, but see this essentially as strength, efficiency, range, and duration that we have in Warframe. And instead of Warframes, we have magic arms which channel the abilities of the omen beasts that we bond with. This is done via packs, which is equivalent to Warframe abilities. Each pact has a separate set of abilities our magic arm can use pertaining to the omen beast. 
This keeps Soul Frame's Envoy building similar to Warframe, while being more familiar to those that played other RPG lights like Destiny and whatnot in the past. Equivalent to using Operator stuff, a Soul Frame also has souls, and as seeking out ancestors allow you to modify how your skill set works. They're essentially the equivalent of charms or accessory systems you'd see in MMO gearing with special unique effects. There's a decently deep customization of builds, but I do not currently think we will see the extent of stat fine tuning in Soul Frame as we're familiar with in Warframe. Soul Frame appears to be a lot more playstyle oriented rather than build oriented, as I doubt you'll have builds you can put together to just annihilate hordes of crowds instantly, say, Mame Equinox. And the game focuses more on less enemy density with bigger threats. I'm actually okay with this, because Soul Frame is not Warframe, nor is it a spiritual successor to Warframe. It should stand as its own independent title, and if DE is interested in experimenting with higher stakes combat inspired by Souls, then they should be free to do so. This also means some may not like the more deliberate, slower paced gameplay, and that is fine. What matters is the game realizes the most of its potential, and I think it has come a long way since last year. Soul Frame seems to be a more narrative-driven with a deliberate combat against fearsome enemies. It is confirmed to be free to play, with a similar premium model to Warframe for cosmetics and platinum. It remains to be seen if similar mechanics to gear slot capacity, potatoes, and tradable platinum will be a thing. But what I am glad is that I don't see any suggestive of the time restrictions Warframe's foundry crafting has. For microtransactions, well, we still have no context. For Tenocon, dungeons were said to be instants with drop in drop out co-op. This means you should be able to freely tackle content with your friends, but also brings into question how the open world will be like, what content there is to do there that isn't dungeon crawling, and whether or not you'll be able to play with friends outside of dungeons. It may be too much to ask for a filled and not empty open world, which plagued the game industry the last couple of years. But if we don't have a filled open world, I'm hoping that the dungeon crawling is extremely polished and a truly unique experience. Many, many different challenges, a massive, hopefully a massive roster of even lesser bosses, more reasons to use interactive environment for combat, etc. Remember, the layout was also said to be procedurally generated for the showcase. My only complaint is for enemies to be more aggressive, as with a few quantities shown they need to pose enough of a threat for not being horde gameplay. At the same time, I realize it is for demonstration purposes. Some are also perfect examples though for what your powers can do, like instantly frying this armored one into a crisp. The ability to temporarily acquire elemental abuse is also interesting because it can be used for level design incorporating puzzles to access new areas, or approach the same puzzle in a different way or returning in the future or changing how combat flows. Such as enemies in rain being stuck with lightning chaining, but flame weapons not working, a draught spreading fire fire across enemies faster, hail letting you freeze enemies caught with the water abilities, etc. I really hope they do something with this, besides just more damage and flashy animations. Also, yes, we have mounts in this game, and holy crap, they look pretty damn good too. Now, let's get to bosses. I really, really like the parry mechanics shown so far. They're deliberate live parries rather than quick time events, and I do feel the bosses should punish by attacking if you hit a clear blocked hit like this on humanoids to teach you to not just spam attacks on them. This is probably also the very first proper boss, so they can save it for the future. Boss animations are very good here, with very well telegraphed swings and deliberate actions, which is a good step outside from what Warframe does. Hitboxes seem okay, but it's hard to say without actually playing yourself. I do think a proper parry should open up a tiny bit of a window for DPS, but that's, again, nitpicking. Especially since the parry window seems generous, so you're probably using parries more to extend a DPS windows rather than creating one, which is what Souls lights do. The Torment Stag 100% reminds me of the Falling Star Beast from Elden Ring. Now, I don't know if it can be done, but the whoever was demoing this boss at Tenogon got hit by its head charge every time. If not already, it should be made that hitting the white light on the head is a high risk, high reward move that can stagger and knock it out of its charge attack since the dodge seems to be somewhat difficult with a big hitbox. Overall, the boss seems like a good first beast boss on how to deal with the omen wards, but the animations could still be cleaned up a bit after some swings since the boss jerks a bit. Some more variety for a phase 2 would be appreciated, such as slams producing nearby AoEs or just a variation in attacks, but there is a ton of potential shown in this boss fight already. As a barebones introduction to omen beast fights in the game, good job, DE. Also, the music is a tiny bit too loud, but oh my god. 
the music productions have completely knocked it out again with the orchestra. But that's just a nitpick. A story-driven combat game, DE has always been better at telling a story than actual gameplay. Play to your strengths, is what I would say. If they can tell a good story, they could spend that time working on improving combat over the next two years, and I think this demo has already proven a solid groundwork on storytelling. Not on the literal lore, but rather on how to tell a story. Show rather than tell. The world is quite immersive and convincing. The delivery is impactful, and if they continue doing this, I think the game has a lot of promise. Now, the heirloom drama. I don't care about the FOMO, honestly. I don't feel like they're obligated to offer the skins forever because I do not personally see the skins, however it is joked as, as the actual long-lasting content. I do not believe in the issue of the skins being unavailable after this year. You literally have three full months to decide. If you cannot decide whether it is worth it to buy over three months, I don't think you have a say in whether it should be available or not. If you cannot find a way to save up enough over this three months, when you truly want these skins, then I don't think you should have a say in whether it should be available or not. It's not like it's around for only 20 days or a month. It's 90 days. If you started playing the game and were not around for the 10 year anniversary, well, they're not obligated to have those cosmetics available for you since you were not around to celebrate it. I also do not believe they should be free because that is what our DAX yearly skins are for. I'm perfectly fine with the skins being paid. But what I do have an issue with is how the heirloom bundles are only available as an option with Regal Aya and Platinum. This, I believe, is an attempt to inflate the price by forcing you to buy the items that might not even be desired by the general public. I get that it is a marketing scheme, but this still feels very backward and thinly veiled. Especially because, whether you want to believe it or not, a massive portion of the Platinum in-game is bought with discounted coupons on PC. The Zenith Heirloom Collection cannot be bought with coupons, where most of the pricing literally comes from Platinum in Naya. Here's the thing, I play gotchas. I'm okay with the prices of gotcha banners and cosmetics because I know what I'm getting into. Because that is what they are known for. If this was a gacha that had $90 skins, I wouldn't bat an eye because that particular game would probably already be known for that. And it is up to you to decide whether you want to buy it or not. What I don't like is when said price is not the status quo, where decisions are made to change how premium content is offered. After the community has already been very familiar with how bundles have been run in the past. The heirloom bundle does not offer that option and set forces you to foot the bill for mostly platinum in Regalia when I guarantee a large non-zero portion of the player base is completely uninterested in purchasing platinum in Regalia to start with. That's my final say on the matter. Also, the regional pricing on this bundle is fucked. I've heard it all, where adjusted regional pricing does not even remotely correlate to the actual intended price. Companion rework changes are the next topic, and they are coming. It is no longer just a rumor, so I'm looking forward to this, because I share the opinion that companions permanently dying in mission for a fast-paced horde-killing game like Warframe has always stuck out as incompatible, because it causes a very jarring response in gameplay to repeatedly revive your pet. Also, that pet AI is not that smart and is rather difficult to make tanky companion builds available on all Warframe loadouts. I want to see our companion as an extension of our arsenal instead of a liability that is primarily for vacuum. Therefore, hearing that auto respawn over time instead of permadeath in missions and a, a mod rework for them for more synergy is huge to me. I want more interactions like the Mecha Set, or Karna Set, or if they ever fix how evasion works, but more reasons to actually bring it out rather than, oh yeah, that one Mecha Set that's useful, but you have to actually use a coup, bro, to do it, yada yada. I don't want that to be the drawback anymore. Therefore, having more reasons to use stuff like the Strain Set, too, would be cool. I want our companion to become another a synergistic tool instead of an afterthought. And I really hope the Companion Rework can achieve this. Also, the next thing, Hydroid Rework is confirmed coming, but we literally know nothing besides one new ability, which means two abilities are going to be combined into one, just like Zephyr's Rework from several years ago. What do I want personally for Hydroid? Well, I haven't thought on it too much before this video, but it'd be cool if he went full Davy Jones and could rise on the storm of a ghostly ship with his ults, launching cannon fire, like a barrage ripping a forwards as a carpet bomb, or maybe two sides. But since this rework is still a long ways off, I just don't consider it very important to think on right now. Especially since DE probably already has their own idea, in which we will see a dev stream next month. Anyways, this is my summary and thoughts on Tenocon 2023. Thank you for the kind wishes and thank you DE for letting me attend, as well as thank you to all of those I 
met. It was a blast and I'll definitely be coming back next year. Cheers! If this is your first time watching, feel free to leave a like to, or better yet, subscribe. Let me know your thoughts down in the comments. 79.5% of you are not subscribed. I'm trying my best to get you new information out always as soon as possible. Like I've done with the Duviri update and now, Tanocon. Stick around if you want to see interesting memes and builds on a nearly daily basis. You won't miss out on any of that, do you? That'll be it for this video. Thank you all for watching and see you all next time.